Ohio's electricity market prospects for 2014. With that, I will now hand it over to Scott Miller, CE3 Director. Thank you, Matt. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And on behalf of Ohio University's Voinovic School of Leadership and Public Affairs, I'd like to welcome you all to the second installment of our 2014 Energy Webinar Series. My name is Scott Miller, as Matt says, and I'm the Director of the School's Consortium for Energy, Economics, and the Environment, which is also known as CE3. Today's webinar, which is entitled Changes in Ohio's Electricity Market Prospects for 2014, is made possible through a grant from the U.S. EPA to help Ohio facilities better understand their compliance obligations through their emissions reporting program. The major grant activities for this project include workshops and webinars such as this one to inform Ohio industry on current trends in Ohio's energy markets and how changes in these markets may change emissions. Also under the grant, Ohio University recently updated our statewide emissions database that was used to create the state's climate action plan. And in the vein of community uh, climate action planning, our next webinar is entitled The Bigger Picture, How Global Climate Research Impacts Ohio. It's currently being scheduled for April 16th, and we'll draw together two authors of the soon-to-be-released second chapter of the newest Intergovernmental Snow on Climate Change, or IPCC, report, a member of President Obama's Climate Change Task Force, and a writer with the regional news organization to discuss the findings of the, of the latest report, and will Ohioans should or shouldn't care about these findings in the report. An announcement on that webinar will be coming out very soon. And as always, all of our events and project work, as well as well as a downloadable version of this webinar, can be found at our website, www.ohio.edu backslash CE3, the number three. I have several logistical responsibilities in opening up today's meeting. First, I'd like to extend my thanks to our strong panel of speakers. We hope you enjoy the dialogue, and I feel sure that you're going to take away something useful from, from, uh, from today's meeting. Second, if you have a question that you would like to submit to our panelists or our staff during the session, we ask that you use the question field on the GoToWebinar navigation pane in the upper right-hand corner of your screen to type in a question for our panelists. We will try to get to as many questions as possible during our time together today. And finally, a link to a brief online evaluation is going to be emailed to you after the webinar. Please take a few minutes to provide us with feedback of today's session so that we can learn from how to improve for future events. And with that, I believe I've covered all of my logistical bases, so it is now my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's webinar, Mark Shanahan. In his current role as principal of New Morning Energy, Dr. Shanahan provides clients strategic guidance on clean energy technology policy and deployment. As Governor Ted Strickland's energy advisor, Mark played a key role in designing, negotiating, and implementing Senate Bill 221, which created Ohio's first advanced energy and efficiency portfolio standard. During his tenure serving four governors as executive director, the Ohio Air Quality Development Authority issued $5.8 billion in bonds supporting investments in air pollution control and prevention, energy efficiency, and clean energy technologies. I think you're going to agree with me that we have the right man to moderate today's panel, so I'm going to step out of the way and turn this webinar over to Mark and our panelists. So Mark, please take it away. Thanks very much, Scott, and good morning, everyone. Uh, as Scott said, my job is to moderate. Uh, what I'm going to do is, is give you a, a two-minute uh, context uh, of what we're talking about and then get to our expert panelists and then later on uh, wrangle your questions and try to make sure we get through as many of them as possible. Uh, in thinking about uh, the panel as it was uh, coming up, uh, I guess I was surprised to realize that when I looked at back at the dates uh, that Ohio has been undergoing a significant transition period for 15 years now in the electricity market. And as you'll hear in much more detail from our panelists, uh, some of those changes have been significant and present serious challenges uh, both to uh, residential and industrial customers as well as commercial customers. Uh, quick overview, uh, in 1999, Senate Bill 3 started us on the journey, uh, promising to move us uh, to market-based electricity generation and purchasing, and to do that over a five-year transition period. As we got close to uh, that five-year deadline, uh, everyone agreed we weren't quite ready. They extended the 
transition period uh, for another three years. And then as we approach 2008, uh, Senate Bill 221 uh, once again took a look at how that deregulation might happen, what the right options were, what the role of the PUCO was, and uh, as Scott mentioned, established uh, energy portfolio standards uh, for the first time uh, in Ohio. Uh, so we have gone through some significant changes in, uh, in the economy, both nationally and globally. Uh, we're seeing uh, major uh, advances in various technologies related to electricity generation and electricity usage. We're seeing new environmental or, uh, regulations as well as significant changes in the potential fuels to provide the electricity. And of course, uh, we are now all in a single regional transmission organization, uh, which was not the case when we started the process. So I'm going to introduce each of our panelists uh, as they speak, and uh, we're going to get started. Our, our first presentation uh, will be by Janine Migden Ostrander. She's currently a principal at the Regulatory Assistance Project, a nonprofit that advises governments and regulators on economically and environmentally sustainable energy policy. Her recent work has covered uh, advising both regulators and advocates on energy efficiency, renewable energy, demand response, distributed generation, and integrated resource planning. Uh, as many of you probably know, before she was with uh, Regulatory Assistance Project, Janine was the Ohio Consumers Council, uh, representing the interest of Ohio's 4.5 million residential households uh, with their investor-owned electric, natural gas, telephone, and water companies. She's been involved with uh, public utility law uh, for more than three decades, uh, working in, in many different roles uh, for not only public agencies, uh, but for uh, private energy companies, uh, as well as a partner at a law firm, Hanlos or Parks. Uh, and so let me just turn it over to Janine and get us underway. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And. Um, Thank you to Ohio University and um, the folks here organizing this conference. Um, I'm going to, what I'm going to do is give you an overview of the changes in Ohio's electricity market over the last 15 years. As Mark notes, it's still in transition and it's been a long journey. Um, so I'm going to start with, um, uh, my cursor is not, not advancing, so where? Off to a good start here. Um, there we go. Um, first, just to give you a little bit of an overview about the Regulatory Assistance Project. We are a global nonprofit team of experts focused on economic and environmentally sustainable power solutions in both the electric and gas industry. Um, we work, we have offices in the United States, India, Europe, China, um, and we do work all across the globe. Um, most of our work in the United States is centered upon um, <clears throat> helping federal, state, and regional entities in advising them on utility and clean air um, issues. And um, we have helped a lot of states achieve ambitious energy efficiency and renewable energy targets and um, have worked on a variety of subjects, which I think Mark discussed in the intro that we've been involved in. We also do a lot of publications and, and reports, and I would invite all of you to visit our website, which is listed at the back of this, um, the end of this presentation. Um, there's a lot of materials there that could be helpful to you, depending upon what issues you're wrestling with. So to dive in. Prior to 1999, Ohio, like um, approximately half of the remaining states, was um, completely vertically integrated and completely regulated by the Public Utilities Commission from the standpoint of distribution, transmission, and generation rates. In, in 1999, Senate Bill 3 was passed, which provided for retail competition and aggregation, as well as uh, the creation of um, competitive bidding for on the wholesale level for a default service rate. So what we had was a dual system here where the utilities could provide service, um, which would engage in a competitive bid process to provide 
electricity for customers who didn't choose. And alongside that, we had a vibrant retail competitive market where individual marketers could market to customers on an individual basis, what we may refer to as door-to-door. -door. And also, Ohio was a leader in the nation in terms of putting together one of the most comprehensive and, and currently active aggregation programs, which allowed municipalities such as a lot of you may have heard of NOPEC, which is a consortium of approximately 125 local governments who band together to provide to to um, provide service through a supplier to their customers if the customers wanted to participate. And I can get into a lot more detail about aggregation and how it works if folks are interested in the question and answer portion. Um, the bill also provided for corporate center separation of generation from transmission and distribution and codes of conduct. This is um, a very important component when you're setting up a competitive market because you want to make sure that all the entities are on an equal playing field, that the incumbent utility does not have a competitive advantage over marketers, which would allow them then to dominate the market and then provide prices that may be above market. So a critical component when you deregulate is you're not necessarily getting rid of regulation of generation altogether. The Public Utilities Commission of Ohio still has a very important role to play in terms of ensuring that the competitive market works fairly. So when you talk about deregulation of generation, what you're really talking about is deregulation of price, that the Regulatory Commission is no longer setting the prices for generation. <clears throat> that is being determined on the competitive market. Because the reality is that when you're dealing with monopolies, you have regulation as a substitute for competition, the theory being that competition will drive down prices and if you have a fair and um, a fair marketplace, fair and transparent marketplace. In the absence of that, you need regulation. So when the General Assembly created competition, it still it, it left the price to be determined on the market, but the terms and conditions of service and the operations of the market still were regulated to make sure that consumers and the public are, are protected. As part of this transition to um, deregulation, this was a huge process with numerous rulemaking proceedings and, and, it was, and um, individual cases involving each of the electric companies. And what was pre presented was a five-year transition period so that the utilities could recover their stranded costs, the theory being that utilities had generating plants that were built years ago, but their prices were above the current market price. And so the utilities who had not fully depreciated those plants and had not fully recovered their costs from their plants needed a mechanism financially to be able to recover that, hence stranded costs, which became a rider component on customers' bills. And at the same time, to protect consumers, the rates were frozen for that five-year period. Under Senate Bill 3, after the five-year freeze, there would be a standard service offer, um, standard, standard service default generation rate, which would be provided through a competitive wholesale bid. So what was set up was, a, was a sort of two mechanisms for customers. One is the customer could choose to go to a retail provider who marketed to them and said, I can give you a, a, um, a good rate. Or they could do nothing and they would be served under the standard service default rate that would be a, that would result from the competitive bid process. So um, at the end of Senate Bill 5, at the end of the transition period, at that particular time, market prices were very high, and that worried a number of policymakers about the sudden switch to a competitive market and what that impact would be on customers' bills. Um, and by that, we're looking at what are the impacts on residential, commercial, and industrial customers who are competing in global marketplaces. So what the Commission did sort of on an ad hoc basis was create an electric security plan, which allowed utilities to come in with a regulated rate that was approved by the Commission. Um, but really, there was no legal basis in the law for this. And so what Senate Bill 221 did was, was somewhat codify what had become sort of an ad hoc practice at the commission. And um, 
so we, we should take a look at what Senate Bill 221 did, which it was a very massive piece of legislation. There were two major components of Senate Bill 221. One was the establishment of rates through a hybrid regulatory market structure. And I'll get into the details of both of these later um, on. And the second was a clean, ener uh, clean energy provisions, which established a renewable portfolio standard, an energy efficiency resource standard, and an alternative energy standard. So we're going to talk for a few minutes about the establishment of rates. Under the establishment of rates, the utilities could choose either to file an electric security plan for, um, um, for commission approval, or they could opt for the market rate option and establish a generation price through a competitive bid. Now, there are two very important components in Senate Bill 221 that you should take note of. The first, which is somewhat um, unprecedented, is that if the utility chose the electric security plan and was dissatisfied with the PUCO's order, he could reject the decision and start the process over. So this was something, this was a right that was granted only to the utilities. And so the concern of some advocates with regard to this provision is that if the PUCO went too far in terms of cutting rates, the, the utility could um, reject the plan. So it kind of, it, it had the impact of somewhat um, cautioning or slowing down the commission from taking steps that might be considered to be very consumer friendly because of the consequences of that kind of a decision as opposed to um, what it might otherwise have done without this provision. Um, also, the other provision was that if the utility chose the market rate option, it would be precluded from law from filing an electric security plan in the future. So they could never come back and, and use the electric security plan process. Now, um, this is important because the electric security plan provided a lot of very a lot of benefits to the electric industry. Some of these benefits that were included in the electric um, security plan included, um, and you know, electric security plan is really the is, is really the term for uh, a new term for filing for a rate increase that the utilities would file for because I never saw an electric security plan result in lower rates. In fact, every security plan resulted in significant rate increases. But here are some of the components of the electric security plan. Automatic recovery of purchase power, emission allowances, and carbon taxes. Uh, recovery through a non-bypassable surcharge of construction work in progress for any generating or pollution control facility um, which could um, occur upon cost and terms, meaning that if the utility company decided that they wanted to build power plants, they could, and at the very beginning of the process with commission approval, they could start recovering the costs for this. Um, from the engineering studies on forward, and we saw this with an AEP filing um, around that time. Um, the important component here also was that this was a non-bypassable charge, which meant that even if a customer switched to another supplier through the retail market that I described under Senate Bill 3, which continued to exist under Senate Bill 221, that customer would still have to pay for that generation, even though their generation was not being provided by the incumbent utility company. So this was a, a, a tremendous benefit, and some would argue created a competitive advantage for the utility company over other suppliers who had to go to the market completely for their financing and cost, rec and re and cost recovery and could not have the benefit of a non-bypassable guaranteed uh, recovery mechanism. And that also extended to once the plant was in server service, so recovery through a non-bypassable sur surcharge for any new plant in service. The utility was also given the opportunity, as part of an electric security plan filing, if it so chose, to include terms, conditions, or charges on limiting shopping, bypassability, backup power, accounting issues, and deferrals. And there's a whole uh, list of things that the utility could include in its electric security plan. So these are reasons why the utility company probably would not want to, so to speak, cut the cord and, and move completely to an MRO. Further, uh, the electric security plan also allowed for automatic increases and decreases in the standard service offer, 
provisions to securitize the phase in of the, of the standard service offer, provisions relating to and including cost recovery for transmission and ancillary services. So those things would also be included. And finally, um, provisions on single issue rate making, decoupling, incentive rate making, distribution infrastructure, and grid moder modernization. Now this last one is sort of a mixed bag. But what's important about the items listed in the slide as a whole is that although the electric security plan is geared towards establishing a generation rate or a standard service offer rate, the utility could also include in their filing issues for recovery of distribution and transmission costs as well. And um, this is outside of the structure of filing for a rate increase for distribution rate. Um, other things that were in this provision that were um, that I think were, were very positive but were not really implemented in any large level were incentive rate making and decoupling. In other words, providing incentives for utilities to make decisions that would move it towards um, advancing perhaps clean energy options. For example, decoupling, which um, which decoupling basically for those, uh, many of you on the call probably know what decoupling is, but for those who don't, um, decoupling is a mechanism that um, basically separates sales from revenue so that the utility is, is somewhat assured of recovering whatever the revenue requirement is that the commission establishes irrespective of sales. So that removes, it's, it's referred to as a throughput incentive, and it removes the disincentive for utility companies to um, create barriers for energy efficiency or um, or distributed generation. Um, if the utility is relying on sales to meet its revenue requirements and at the same time trying to push mechanisms that reduce sales to create the financial problem for the utility. So these mechanisms in the bill were designed to help the utility advance um, energy efficiency and other uh, and distributed generation and other um, clean energy solutions. The market rate option that was contained in Senate Bill 221 had a competitive bidding process to be conducted by an independent third party in a transparent process open to all parties. There was a limitation that at least 25% of load bid by an entity other than um, a distribution utility and that there be four bidders. So um, in other words, the distribution utility could, through the bid, procure 75% of the load but not 100% of the load. And you had to have at least four bidders to make sure that there was some um, identification of robust competition in the auction process. Another requirement was that the distribution company had to belong to a regional transmission organization. And as Mark pointed out, at the beginning, Ohio's utilities were split between two regional transmission organizations, some being in the Midwest uh, Independent System Operator, ISO, MISO, or some belonging to PJM. Um, about four years ago, three or four years ago, and Kerry can probably give you the exact date to a closer, um, all of the Ohio utilities moved into PJM, which from an um, administration standpoint and an ease of delivery and power flows was, was a positive um, move. Um, the, commission, um, the commission also would have to approve the bid, which became the standard service offer. So once all the bids were in and it was tallied and the rate was, was declared, the commission, if the commission thought that there was something wrong with the bid price, that maybe it was too high and higher than what the market price should be, or that there was some sort of problem in the bidding, the commission could um, exercise its authority to not approve the bid and require another bid. Um, this has never happened. Um, the bids that have been, um, that have taken place have pretty much been approved by the Commission. Only First Energy has conducted an auction, but it did so under the ESP and not the MRO creating a hybrid within a hybrid. So Ohio has perhaps one of the most complex um, laws in the nation with regard to how we deal with generation, the establishment of generation and other rates. So 
First Energy probably chose to do to conduct a market um, an auction within the ESP because it wanted to retain the benefits and the flexibility of um, having adjust making adjustments to distribution and other kinds of costs, which I which were discussed in previous slides. And in fact, when they filed for the ESP, their ESP did not include just um, a competitive bid, but also included recovery of a lot of these other costs as well. Okay, it's not kind of getting stuck here, so sorry. Um, okay, here we go. So the market rate option for AEP, Duke, and DPNL who have not chosen the market rate option. The legislation also requires that the process of competitive bidding would be phased in over five years with 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, 50% of the load bid in years one through five, respectively. So these competitive bid rates were then blended with the ESP approved rates for the remaining load, which is what we um, discussed above. Um, beginning in the um, second, phase, second year, the commission can alter the phase in and blending ratio. So if the utility or the made a, a case for if there was a reason to say we want to increase the market rate option because we want to increase the amount that we're taking from this from the standard service offer because the competitive bid market price is a good price, or for whatever other reasons the commission could alter it. Or if the commission felt that the market rate option was much higher than the utilities um, generation rate that I wanted to charge, it could decrease the amount that would be um, blended into the total rate by decreasing the amount of um, capacity that would be bid in the competitive bid process. The clean energy, the Senate Bill 221 also had a clean energy standard. SB 221 mandated the following that um, renewable portfolio standard of 12.5% with the solar set aside of 0.5% by 2025, an energy efficiency resource standard of 22.5% by 2025, and SB 221 was subsequently amended to include uh, combined heat and waste into the energy efficiency standard as well, um, with certain limitations and caveats attached. There was also um, another provision called the Alternative Energy Standard, which included advanced technology, storage, waste heat, um, and um, could also include more energy efficiency, which also had to be at 12.5% by 2025. Now, the thinking was that with the Energy Efficiency Resource Standard, that this would be an opportunity for customers to have more control over their usage and to take steps to lower their bills. And that when you look at a portfolio of, of, op of resource options, energy efficiency is counted as a resource option along, supply, along with supply options is the least cost option. So energy efficiency uh, provided a hedge against cost increases that were contained in the other portions of Senate Bill 221. And so it was a very important co um, component from a consumer protection standpoint and was the basis for uh, Consumers Council when I was the Consumers Council supporting this standard. Since Senate Bill 221, there have been a couple of new developments that are worth, worth commenting on very quickly, because uh, I see I'm getting near the end of my time here. So, um, The first is Senate Bill 58. Efforts to pass legislation, but this is an effort by the legislature that would freeze the energy efficiency resource standards and the renewable portfolio standard. It did not pass in the last legislative session after um, many hearings and discussions. However, the, a new version is under discussion. Um, we don't have the details. It has not been publicly disclosed yet. There was an article in Sunday's uh, called the Dispatch about it that discussed uh, creating a freeze and then um, and we don't know whether that means that the utilities would continue under their existing percentages or whether that means that they could just stop it altogether. That we're, we're awaiting details on that, but we, the public, it has not been publicly released. Um, so we'll have to see what happens with that. But passage of Senate Bill 58 would be a step backwards 
um, as an updated analysis, and that's, and that's a personal view here. Um, an updated analysis by the Ohio State University Center for Resilience showed that the original substitute, Senate Bill 58 from last, Senate, from last session, if it went into place, into effect, would cost Ohio customers $3.94 billion more in electricity bills with annual increases of $302.8 million. So that goes back to the point that I was making earlier, that when you line up the options for supplying resources for customers, energy efficiency is the least cost option. And if you remove that option, then you're left with supply side options that are much more expensive and are going to raise rates for customers. So we'll have to wait and see what happens with that. And I just thought today in my emails that the electric, that the Edison Electric Institute just came out with a study that showed how much was um, spent on energy efficiency and that the savings far exceed the cost expenditures by consumers around the nation. Okay. Um, then, then there was case number 123151ELCOI, which is a commission investigation. There's, basically, in this docket, the commission asked for questions um, and noted that there were a lot of changes happening. And, and the interesting thing is, is that the electric industry is, is, is in constant change and constant evolution with, with, because of a whole host of factors. Um, much different than it was 30 years ago, where utilities routinely came in for rate cases and there wasn't much of happening. But the commission noted, in light of changing conditions with plant retirement, uh, new clean air regulations, demand response, and energy efficiency being bid into the market, a lot of new proposed transmission projects to alleviate locational um, to alleviate locational deliver deliverability area in the Northeast Ohio. But there was a need to see comments on market design, corporate separation, um, and, um, re uh, and uh, related issues. And I encourage you to take a look at that docket. I've provided the link above for you to go ahead and do so. Um, comments and reply comments have been filed, and there has been um, no further activity. But there's 11 pages of docketing uh, in the docket sheet of a filing, so there's been quite a, a lot of activity over the over the over the last year on this on this issue. Um, status of competitive bidding, very quickly. First Energy, um, first uh, it was the first utility to corporately separate and conduct a declining clock auction under an electric security plan, and the and the standard service offer rates are set through the auction. And um, if anybody wants more detail on how the declining clock auction works, I'd be happy to answer questions on that later. Um, American Electric Power has, provi has proposed utilizing an auction-based pricing for its standard service offer beginning in um, June 2015 through the um, full term of its proposed electric security plan. Duke, um, because the energy from its leg legacy generating assets would be sold into the market and a portion of the net profits already returned to Duke's customers, the energy there would not be available to serve loads. So they have um, proposed to hold periodic auctions through a competitive bid process. And they will be using a descending um, price clock auction as well. As for DPNL, the DPNL proposed um, for it um, to use basically to basically follow the terms in the, in the legislation of conducting an auction of with increasing amounts of load over a period of years and set forth there. So, um, in conclusion, um, I would simply note that 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 we that Ohio is very unique in how it has addressed competitive bidding and addressed market issues. Um, there is. In recent years, with lower market prices, due in part because of the energy efficiency being bid into the market and because of lower natural gas prices, there is more of an interest to, in accelerating the move towards um, competitive bidding. Um, there are still a lot of things that are in flux, and we're going to really have to watch closely and see what happens with Senate Bill 58. And um, the final point I would make is that this legislation was somewhat of a quid pro quo where there were a lot of things that were given to the utilities to help them financially, but at the same time there were protections and things given to consumers in the clean energy section, mostly through demand response and energy efficiency, and, and um, it would be important to maintain that balance. 
And with that, I will turn it over to Mark. Thanks, Janine. Uh, I, I think everybody, if you didn't already, uh, you now have a very good sense of how complicated the process is within Ohio. Uh, each of our investor-owned utilities is at a different place in terms of spinning off its generation assets. Uh, First Energy has fully legally separated. Uh, AEP is moving in that direction. Duke has announced they're selling their generation assets, and DPNL is still assessing exactly uh, how it will move forward. All of that and moving into a competitive market to, uh, to competitive bids has made everyone, I think, much more conscious of the role that regional transmission organizations play. Uh, and as, as Janine pointed out, we are now, all of Ohio is in a single uh, regional transmission organization. And that's why uh, we have our next panelist, Kerry Stroop. Uh, who is the manager of uh, regulatory and legislative affairs uh, for PJM Interconnection. Uh, PJM Interconnection was founded in 1927, and its job is to ensure the reliability of high voltage electric power systems uh, serving uh, 54 million people uh, in, 13, in all or parts of 13 states plus the District of Columbia. Uh, Kerry is, uh, coordinates affairs with state regulatory and legislative bodies in Kentucky, Ohio, and West Virginia. Uh, before uh, joining PJM, he was the Associate Director of the National Regulatory Research Institute. And for most of his career, he worked in the state regulatory sector at the Public Utilities Commission of Ohio, uh, where he administered the divisions of telecommunications and electricity, and then became Director of the Utilities Department. Uh, everybody on the panel has great academic credentials, but I'm going to mention one of Kerry's because given the complexity and the many different stakeholders and all the things that are going on around electricity, I think he has a degree that is most appropriate, and that is he has his doctorate from Ohio State in cultural anthropology. And uh, what's going on with electricity right now is nothing if it's not a, a lengthy study in cultural anthropology. So Kerry, tell, talk to us about what you, what the RTO is up to. Well, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, it really is my pleasure to be here today with all of you. And I thank uh, the Ohio University as well as Bonneville School for inviting me to uh, be a part of the, the webinar today. Um, Janine has, has spent uh, some time laying down kind of the foundation of uh, where the retail marketplace uh, is in Ohio, and my task today is really to provide kind of an underpinning for how that retail uh, marketplace works by focusing on the wholesale market and by focusing on uh, the mechanisms that PJM employs to assure the reliable operation of the high voltage uh, power grid, as Mark indicated, is our task at PJM. I am going to find the right button here, oh, page down, page up. Uh, maybe you can advance the slide for me, Matt. There we go. Um, well, PGM is a regional transmission organization, uh, or an RTO, as it's often called. RTOs really are uh, entities that are uh, regulated by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. They are organizations. Uh, designed to manage the reliability of the electric transmission system, as well as the wholesale electricity market. And it's that market that, uh, from which is derived really uh, uh, the competitive bids that Janine was talking about, and uh, the, the wholesale price of electricity, which of course is a foundation for the retail prices ultimately that customers will pay uh, in Ohio and elsewhere. Um, PJM, as you can see here uh, by the, uh, the map and the statistics, is a relatively large organization geographically. Um, effectively, what we do is employ um, uh, over 160, actually I think that we have uh, 183,000 megawatts of generation in our footprint, um, over 1,350 generating units and 60,000 miles of transmission lines, 
And so when you put all those together and consider that what we do is assure the reliable flow of power over those lines to meet load uh, on a 24-hour uh, basis, seven days a week, and we're also responsible for looking out uh, 15 years into the future and assuring that uh, uh, our planning of the transmission system is adequate and appropriate and that there are sufficient generating resources uh, being developed to supply power over that, over that uh, time frame. Um, let me go to the next slide here and talk about, you know, I guess I'll, I'll have uh, Matt take me to the next slide. Could you do that for me, Matt? There we go. Um, th this graphic really is intended to boil down, you know, what PGM needs to do in every moment, on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. And it's really to maintain the frequency uh, in hertz of the flow of electricity on the grid at 60, 60 hertz. How do we do that? Well, we really balance, of course, the amount of power that's being generated within PJM and imported into PJM with the uh, demand, uh, instantaneous demand of, uh, of uh, customers within PJM plus the power that's exported, plus the losses that occur because of the thermal uh, and physical properties of electricity lines. And that's really what system operation is all about. Uh, but in order to do that, we uh, uh, really employ uh, a, 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 I'll call it a, a hybrid of kind of a, a system operators on the one hand in a marketplace energy market, uh, market for ancillary services like uh, uh, spinning reserves or black start uh, services. Uh, we, we employ a marketplace to uh, incentivize a behavior of load serving entities and generators on the system uh, in such a way as to assure that the system remains reliable and adequate, uh, not only in the moment, but day ahead, and then, as I said, 15 years out through our planning, uh, our planning uh, uh, requirements. Next slide, please. I'm focusing today, though, uh, on one particular aspect of PJM's market, and I know Susan is going to be uh, speaking to the capacity market as well on the outcome of that market, and that is something that's called the reliability pricing model, RPM. It's a construct that uh, uh, was authorized by FERC for PGM to use to look uh, three years ahead into the future and to secure through an auction um, a, a, uh, a sufficient amount of capacity uh, that is megawatts uh, to meet demand that's anticipated three years ahead plus a reserve margin. Right now our reserve margin in PGM is about 15 and a half percent. And so uh, what we intend to do through the, the RPM mechanism is to identify a, a price through an auction process uh, that will be paid all generators as well as other kind of resources like demand side resources and energy efficiency resources that clear in this auction. And uh, uh, once they clear, they're actually committed to show up three years later or face very uh, significant penalties. And this is the sense in which the RPM really provides forward investment signals so that if uh, uh, we, we have a good handle on three years out what um, the price is that has cleared that clears a sufficient amount of resources to meet that demand plus reserve margin, which I spoke of a moment ago. Uh, next slide, please. Now, um, we, we operate in PGM on a planning year basis, so from June of this year, June 2014 through May 2015 would be one, one planning year. And this May, uh, just in a few months, we will be conducting a capacity auction for the 2000, what would it be, 2017-2018 uh, planning year. Uh, either existing generation or generation that isn't 
uh, really iron in the ground yet, but is planned, may be offered into the auction. Transmission upgrades that increase the uh, capacity available to uh, a, uh, an area, perhaps even a specific area within PJM, uh, can be offered into the auction. And then demand resources that either exist now or are planned may also be offered into the auction. And uh, we strive to have market rules that really uh, establish a level playing field for demand response alternatives, new transmission solutions, and generation. And uh, um, there's one point I probably should have made on this slide. I, I referenced it a moment ago when I spoke of the fact that uh, sometimes uh, the, the, what the auction does is really resolve uh, capacity issues for specific areas within PJM. Let me give you an Ohio example. Um, the ATSI zone, which is the uh, first energy uh, uh, distribution companies in northern Ohio, as well as uh, a little piece of Pennsylvania and uh, uh, West Virginia. But in any case, that is one zone that in the course of preparing for the auction, we model uh, zones in which we anticipate there might be capacity shortfalls uh, for various reasons that we anticipate. And we then model the extent to which the transmission system itself enables the flow of capacity from uh, outside of, a, of a, an area to supplement the capacity that already exists within it. So in the ATSI zone, um, uh, there are, of course, generating resources within northern Ohio. Uh, but given the uh, retirement of uh, some facilities, generating facilities in northern Ohio, uh, due to the implementation of the MATS rule, Mercury and Air Toxic Standard Rule uh, promulgated by the US EPA, we determined in our modeling that there would need to really be a separate auction conducted for the first energy or the ATSI zone, which is called a local deliverability area, by the way, if you really want to get into the, the acronyms here. Anyway, um, what this all comes down to, and the point I'm trying to make is that the price of capacity can vary uh, across the PJM footprint depending whether a specific area or zone, like the ATSI zone, is transmission constrained and is short of capacity internally, and therefore uh, uh, a higher price really is anticipated to clear uh, to attract new generating resources or other resources inside that zone. Next slide, please. This gives you an idea. This slide, uh, there's a lot of information packed in here, but, but basically there are some trends that I, I think you could, uh, you could discern if you take a look at the slide. Um, you'll see that uh, during the 2007 and 2008 uh, delivery year, that's when this RPM was first implemented. Since that time, we've definitely had a significant increase in the amount of demand resources both offered into the capacity auction as well as demand resources that cleared that auction. Uh, that's that graph on the top, the blue line, really uh, shows the amount of DR that's cleared in the auction and then the green uh, shows the amount of demand response that was actually offered. Um, it, I hope you won't interpret uh, the fact that the, the purple there, which is energy efficiency, uh, it, that's the amount that actually cleared. It, it's just sitting on top of the DR, uh, but it actually cleared in the auction because, as Janine said, um, there are energy efficiency resources that are uh, quite reasonable in terms of their costs, and so uh, they, uh, if they offer it at a lower cost than a higher uh, cost uh, resource, they, they will clear. Um, if you look at the bottom, the bottom graph here, what this really shows you is that since 2007, the green and the blue bars together, that's essentially, uh, the first two, that's essentially gas-fired facilities. Combustion turbines, gas turbines, and combined cycle plants, which are really efficient uh, gas baseload facilities, they far outweigh the amount of capacity that has been uh, cleared 
that is represented by uh, the other the other kinds of resources here, whether it be it uh, hydro, steam, nuclear, solar, wind, or fuel cell. And you'll see there, our uh, coal isn't even mentioned here. Really, there was one uh, entity that cleared in the auction uh, a coal-fired plant that's now in bankruptcy in in West Virginia. But the basic story here is that uh, as if we go to the next slide, I think I've set myself up well to talk to the challenges we're facing at the uh, wholesale level over the next couple of years. And I'll mention demand in a moment, but since I've given myself a lead into the world's largest fuel switch, we are really witnessing a, uh, a very significant uh, upheaval in the wholesale market in terms of the, uh, the retirement of coal facilities and the, uh, the addition um, and proposed addition of gas-fired facilities. And over the next few years, as uh, some of my slides uh, that we'll look at later will illustrate, I hope, uh, you'll see that we're, we're going to go through a two to three year uh, transition period where it will be a challenge to uh, uh, maintain reliability. I'm sure we'll achieve it, but it will be at a price. There will be higher capacity prices um, that we may anticipate, uh, and uh, uh, we'll get to that here in a moment in some of my other slides. But, but basically, so we're undergoing this fuel switch. Now, the, you know, there's, I, I painted it in a rather dark uh, way, but it's also a good thing. And why is that? Well, it, and what's driving it? Of course, it's the retirement of coal and the pressures uh, that are placed on coal generation because of its environmental uh, characteristics. But uh, on the other hand, you know, we're looking at uh, a, uh, a, a development of the Marcellus and Utica shale gas and uh, fracking technology and so on and so forth that is really uh, dramatically increasing the amount of natural gas that's available. And as a result, it's lowering the cost of, of that gas. And so that's the basis for this uh, world's largest fuel switch that we're seeing. In terms of electricity demands, um, uh, well, the trend, of course, has been uh, uh, really flat. Uh, you know, for many years in the um, electricity industry, uh, decades ago, one could just basically take a ruler and uh, graph paper and, and uh, anticipate that the demand would grow, you know, three, four, sometimes even five percent a year. Um, it was certainly not the case anymore. I mean, what we anticipate. Uh, for PJM over the course of the next several years is, is a fairly flat uh, to 1% increase in demand uh, each year. Uh, but uh, demand trends can change. Um, um, and they clearly have changed if we even go back over the last 10 years and we look at, for planning purposes, what PJM had planned uh, as necessary to procure. Uh, or is necessary to, to uh, where, where the transmission system might need to be bolstered to feed growing demand? Well, uh, with the recession that began in, in 2008, thereabouts, uh, we really saw demand dr dramatically drop off in areas that were anticipated to, to boom. And I'm talking here about the, uh, uh, the, the mid-Atlantic region and Washington, D.C., Baltimore. Um, in fact, uh, you know, PGM had planned and our board of managers had authorized uh, a large 765 uh, kilovolt transmission line to be built through West Virginia to provide uh, power that was thought to be needed in the D.C. and Baltimore area and so forth. And then given the, the, uh, the uh, demand forecast dropping off, uh, that line was canceled. So this is uh, Yet another challenge, anticipating what, what's going to happen there. Uh, there are in reserve margins. Uh, PGM has enjoyed uh, a, uh, a, a, good, a strong reserve margin, I should say, uh, historically. You know, our reserve margin has been uh, 30 or 35 percent, really, um, uh, several years back. It is narrowing. Um, we anticipate over the next several years we're certainly going to uh, still meet our reserve margin, that meaning the amount of reserves that is required above and beyond the anticipated peak uh, demand. But we are clearly going to 
have our so-called operating margin shrink. And that's really uh, a concern uh, for us that we're going to need to keep our, our eye on. The operating margin really is the, uh, the ability to call on resources uh, that are necessary immediately uh, in the face of a contingency that, that may happen or that has happened. Um, and uh, those reserve margins are nearing. So we're going to we're have to keep our eye on that. Given the uh, development of the uh, natural gas generating resources that was illustrated on the previous slide, a, a concern has been raised, and in, actually it was with an exclamation point uh, raised uh, over the, the, this uh, past winter in January. Um, there turn out to be um, really discontinuities between the way that the power wholesale power market and the wholesale gas market uh, have operated. They haven't needed to be as clearly uh, aligned as we now anticipate they will need to be going forward and giving the higher dependence on gas. And just some ideas uh, to throw your way to suggest that the discontinuity between these markets well, where the, the power market really operates on a 24-7 basis, and if I'm a generator on a Sunday uh, and I anticipate needing uh, that I'm going to want to run on Monday, well, I'll put my bid into the PJM marketplace, and uh, uh, if my bid clears in the day ahead market, then I'm a committed resource for that day. Um, but it so happens that natural gas operates in a different way. They don't work over the weekend. Um, you can't procure gas unless you do it through a bilateral trade. Uh, uh, on a, I'll call it a Rolodex basis um, on a Sunday. Uh, if, you're, if you anticipate that you're going to be running on a Monday, uh, you don't even know if you're, you, you've cleared in the market yet, but you need to buy your gas in, a market, in the gas wholesale market on a Friday. Sometimes you actually have to buy three days' worth of gas, Friday, Saturday, sun, or Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, to even get uh, that gas on Monday. So there are really commercial uh, discontinuities, discontinuities in the way that the markets themselves operate. And of course, there is the issue that really isn't referenced on this slide, but it's something worth noting. And that is that uh, the gas infrastructure, the pipeline infrastructure, uh, will certainly need to be uh, upgraded in some cases in order to uh, to enable additional gas-fired resources to locate uh, where they may be needed. Um, there are a host of other issues I won't get into now. Uh, that we are really vetting these issues in PJM um, within a uh, our stakeholder process, a, a task force that's been been established to. Uh, to really identify what the problems are and the potential solutions for coordination of gas and, and electricity generation going forward. And then finally, of course, the integration of, uh, of demand-side resources, uh, distributed generation, and, and intermittent resources like wind. Um, many of you may have seen in the press uh, the fact that we've had, uh, uh, we recently issued a study that indicated that from a reliability perspective, PGM could integrate uh, 30,000 megawatts of wind uh, and, and do that without threatening uh, reliability, 30,000 additional megawatts of wind. Um, uh, that study did not address the uh, cost aspects of doing so, but it looked at it, that from a reliability basis. And then uh, I'll come in a little bit later. If we go to the next slide, uh, I have an opportunity to talk about integration demand side resources. Next slide, please. Um, this one we can pass over here. I think this really shows uh, uh, what I indicated on an earlier slide. Again, the, it's what, what's clear in the marketplace is really uh, in the capacity market, combined cycles, combustion turbines, gas turbines. This, the coal happens to be on this slide. There uh, have been some coal plants that uh, uh, cleared somewhere south of 4,000 megawatts over since 2007. but. Um, we really don't anticipate any additional coal plants to be built in PJM at this point in time. Uh, next slide, please. 
Here uh, is a, uh, just a graphic that really depicts the shift that we've seen um, from uh, gas uh, to gas and from coal. Whereas in 2007, we had 66,000 plus megawatts of coal uh, fired installed capacity. That has now shrunk to a little over 45,000 megawatts. Whereas gas has taken the other tact and gone from uh, over 47,000 megawatts to 61,000 megawatts. The other uh, resources, of course, renewable uh, grew more than tenfold, but it still is a small portion of the overall fuel mix, now amounting to 961 megawatts, whereas it was 65 megawatts in 2007. Nuclear has been in solid waste, have uh, been pretty much the same. There's petroleum has diminished a little bit, and hydroelectric has uh, maintained its, uh, its portion. Next slide, please. Yes. Hey, carry, carry its mark if, if just so we make sure we I'll leave some time yep. for questions. Yeah, thanks. We'll do. Okay, uh, I think we can. Uh, this is just another another perspective on uh, the sea change that we're trying to manage. I'll go to the next slide, please. Hey, Matt, can you? There we go. There we go. This one, uh, again, just illustrates the uh, significant amount of coal retirements that we've had. The size of the circle really indicates the, uh, the magnitude of a plant that is retired. The, the red circles are pending coal retirements. The green ones are uh, uh, new capacity announcements. But you can see Ohio in particular has been, been affected by the significant amount of uh, coal generation that has retired. Uh, in Ohio. Next slide. Um, I'm just about done here. Really, I want, want you to note here that uh, this is uh, that uh, has cleared uh, on, and the amount, well, I should put it this way, the amount of coal-fired generation that has cleared in our capacity auctions over the last three years has really diminished. Uh, for this coming planning year, 11,300 megawatts of coal-fired generation had cleared. Uh, but for the next year, less than 5,000 megawatts, or 5,000 megawatts less had cleared, and uh, even less cleared for the following year. So this shows, again, that uh, we're, we have fewer coal resources to count on to uh, fulfill our baseload requirements. Next slide. Next slide, please. Um, and one comment here uh, in terms of what's in our queue, which is looking at interconnection to the, the system. It's almost, uh, well, it's primarily natural gas, 62 percent, whereas the uh, wind follows with 26 uh, percent of the total that's in the queue at this point. Next slide. Uh, demand resources have increased. I won't belabor that opinion uh, or that, that point at this uh, at this juncture, although you can see that in the last auction, uh, actually, they went down. The amount of demand response uh, that was offered went down, and the amount that cleared went down. We anticipate that may be the case again in the upcoming auction because of some more stringent requirements that we're putting on demand resource operability uh, and uh, uh, the, the, also the, the terms under which demand resources are offered. And so, uh, leave it. Uh, you can ask me about it uh, later. But we expect perhaps more or fewer DR uh, resources to clear in the next auction. Next slide. Uh, this is a, uh, a really a graph of, of the price uh, that across the PJM footprint. Uh, a comparison between 2008, 11, 12, and 13. You can see that the price of energy has dramatically declined, although it went up just a little bit from 2012 to 2013. Uh, transmission prices have increased uh, really just to pay for uh, uh, enhancements and additions to the transmission system. Capacity prices uh, have uh, gone you know, from 8.12 8 uh, uh, to 9.49, 6.02, and 7.10. And I know Susan will be talking about anticipated capacity prices uh, next. Um, next slide. 
Uh, again, to drive the point home, the, the blue uh, line there below the zero is the amount of retirements that uh, we expect to see in 2014-15 planning year, 15-16 planning year, and then uh, very few in the next planning year. But it's getting through this period, and you look at that cumulative change, you know, we're going to be down over 8,000 megawatts in the 15-16 planning period. That is going to translate into an increase in capacity prices over the course of, over the, uh, the scope of the entire RTO. Uh, uh, next slide. Terry, we really got to wrap up to Yep, I've, we're done. I've, I've talked about this. Uh, we've had gas electric issues. I think we can, we can just go to the next slide. Uh, and uh, if you have questions on this interface issue, just give me, uh, just give them to me. And I won't address that at this point. People can ask me questions about that graph if they'd like to. Great. Sorry to have gone over. It's okay. Thanks, Kerry. Um, so a lot of uh, changes, a lot of new issues. I think uh, in the course of the two presentations, you've probably heard some things that uh, everybody except the largest customers didn't pay that much attention to in the past and now become critical for their future planning uh, of how to deal with electricity. So we thought that our next presenter would be exactly the right one to begin to, uh, pr to address that. Uh, Suzanne Buckley began her energy career in 1992, joining American Electric Power as an environmental engineer uh, and building up extensive knowledge about utility rate structures. Uh, she then joined the Wholesale Energy Market Group at AEP uh, and added deregulated wholesale energy operations, wholesale energy trading, electricity deal structuring, and energy marketing uh, to her, her knowledge base. Uh, moved to Inter Integris uh, Energy Services as Director of Commercial and Industrial Business Development for Ohio. And uh, in 2009 became one of the founding partners of Scioto Energy, uh, which is now helping over 6,500 commercial and industrial clients navigate the waters of electric deregulation. And I think after what we've uh, learned already today, uh, Suzanne, it's really clear we need some help with navigation, so I'm going to let you do that. Great. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, everybody, for sticking with uh, the, the webinar. And thank you to OU. Uh, this is exceptional and, and, and really uh, great for me since I'm, I'm an OU grad. Um, I'm just going to kind of jump in. We don't have a ton of time, but I think Janine and Carrie set the stage for, you know, we needed the laws, we needed the regulations, we needed the tariffs, we needed the market construct provided by PJM, and all those things come together uh, to really provide commercial viability in the retail space. And that's what we have in Ohio currently. Uh, just to give everybody a backdrop, in 2008, very, very little shopping was happening in Ohio. Uh, but then with the you know, whole economic market crashing, that pulled down the energy market, which then created an opportunity for market rates to be competitive with tariff rates, so much so customers started to switch. And we saw at that time, around 2008-2009 time period, probably a handful of suppliers in this market, maybe three or four, and maybe three or four brokers. Um, at this time, we have 75 licensed suppliers in the state of Ohio, of which about 30 are actually flowing electrons, and we have 350 energy brokers, which are licensed individuals to help people get into uh, a deregulated contract versus a regulated tariff. So the space is insane right now. People are you know, from a customer standpoint, they're getting calls all the time. And even for the folks on the phone, I'm sure you're seeing that even at your households where you're getting solicited uh, to get off a utility rate. About 70% of the market, I think we're nearing 70%, has switched. And I, I mean the commercial and industrial space. So the, it's hugely viable right now. Uh, customers are seeing between 10 and 30%. Uh, savings by shopping. So let me explain uh, what goes into energy pricing and where we are today. So the three phases of uh, energy bill are generation, transmission, and distribution. 
The generation piece is the manufacturing of the electron. That is the piece that is deregulated that we're all shopping for. And that comprises about 70% of your overall cost. Transmission is moving that electron over the high voltage line. Uh, goes down into a substation where that voltage is stepped down and then delivered through the local utility distribution system. The transmission and distribution piece are regulated. They fall under the uh, tariff with the exception of AEP customers whose transmission piece is part of uh, the deregulated piece. So what we're focused on is the 70%. If we look at that 70%, uh, the, through the market construct, suppliers have to provide certain services. Uh, the largest component of that service is energy, the actual electron. But there are other components, such as capacity that Carrie mentioned. Uh, suppliers have to buy capacity to, to meet the uh, demands of individual customers. They have to buy things like the renewable portfolio standards, which Janine made mention of, the RPS standards that falls into the other category. And then they have to gross up the amount of energy they have to buy on the uh, supply side to get it to the customer because as that electron moves over the lines, it's losing power along the way. In the current uh, year, calendar year, and as Carrie mentioned, PJM operates in a planning year that starts in June. Um, the rates for customers are 90% made up of energy. What's going to happen due to the capacity market is come June 15, and this pie is for the ATSI zone or first energy, that capacity market takes up what was 5% of your cost, makes up now 40% of your cost. Um, for Duke, AEP, and Dayton customers, it's not as extreme, but it does go from 5% to 20%. So what is driving this? And, and these costs are general, and it's typical of a one-shift operation. Uh, let's, let's, let's see what's driving this. Um, the first slide here is I want to show what does that mean? What does that impact? on a customer of this increase in capacity. And if a customer is paying in the low five cent range today, that capacity increase in the first energy territory means approximately three cents to their total cost, which is pretty extreme. Um, and you know, if it's one of if it's not been on their radar, it needs to get on their radar and managed if possible. This chart shows, looking at that blue, peer, blue piece of the pie, uh, what's going on in the energy markets. And the news in that space is good. As Carrie mentioned, you know, there are wholesale markets that are operating. In Ohio, there are four fairly liquid wholesale trading locations. This chart happens to be the first energy um, round the clock, which means every hour of every day of the entire year, uh, energy is delivered, what is the value of that forward contract? So just like pork bellies and orange juice and natural gas, electricity is traded on the forward market. So we can buy today energy for delivery in 2017. The graph on the left here shows uh, nearing the 2008, this peak and extreme drop was really in reaction to what was happening in the economy. And as this thing just continued to crater down, crater down, what else was happening is the influx of shale gas, which continued to create a bearish spin on this market. Um, we also had in January here uh, some environmental regulations that did not uh, receive, they were supposed to be implemented, they were not implemented, which continued this downward trend. The other interesting piece of this is not only the downward trend, but the spread of year-over-year -year premium has really collapsed. So if you wanted to buy a three-year contract in January of 2011, and you wanted to uh, 
lock it all in at one time, you'd be paying a pretty significant premium, almost $10 a megawatt hour to do that. This spread has completely collapsed and now we're sitting at, and this is this graph to the right is a blow up of this highlighted area. Uh, we're sitting at a market which we call backwardation, which means that the out years are actually cheaper than the front years. Uh, the polar vortex had a lot to do with this. And also there, uh, I think a lot of the market is considering all the shale gas that's going to be entering the market uh, come uh, 16 and 17. From a statistic point of view, calendar year 15 is trading 3% off the all-time lows. 16 is 2 percent, 17 is 2 percent. So if we look at the energy market, which makes up a lion's share of a customer's bill, the market is saying it is not a bad time to look at long-term purchases. Uh, it is a very uh, prudent time to buy. Combating this, though, is this capacity market. And Carrie did a great job uh, kind of explaining what that is, but essentially, it is a payment for the installation of assets to serve load. And again, we have two zones here in Ohio, the ATSI zone, which is first energy, and then the rest of Ohio, which is called the RTO zone. Uh, there is a separation in pricing where the ATSI zone is really uh, seeing a significant increase in the coming years. But this capacity is a payment that we all make to those power plant owners for being there. And it's a price signal as to where we need more assets, whether it be power generation built or transmission lines built to get the power in those areas. The capacity price is set by auction three years in advance. There's a base residual auction, which has set the lion's share of that rate. There are three incremental auctions thereafter, um, but all four of these are combined volumetrically to get the buying final zonal price. So what have been the results? Um, the results over the last couple years have, you can see that, you know, prior to 2012, we've averaged around $100 and $110 a megawatt day. And that is a weird unit of measure, which I'm going to kind of translate in the next slide. But really, this is the anomaly. 12 and 13 really had low prices. Well, if you think back, well, what was going on three years prior to that? That was 2009. That was you know, economic Armageddon. Demand was stripped off the grid. Manufacturers were turning down. And that auction price came in low. We're coming out of that now. And while it seems like capacity is rising, it's actually just going back to almost normal levels with the exception of this first energy, uh, 2015. And this piece right there is really what we have to manage. So what does that weird unit of measure mean in dollars and cents? Each customer has an obligation that they have to buy a certain amount of capacity. And I'm going to get into how that is generated in a minute, but the economic impact for customers is if you have the one megawatt of capacity obligation, you take the auction rate and multiply it by 365 days in the year, and that comes up with your annual cost. So some, this, this capacity concept, most customers are today are paying $10,000, $12,000 per megawatt every year. Now it's going to be, in starting June, that's going to cost around $40,000. And in June of 15, for first energy customers, that's going to go up to $122,000. So you can see, you know, you start thinking about a manufacturer's budget, something that they're paying $10,000 today in first energy, they're going to be paying $122,000 uh, in June of 15. So how are capacity costs calculated on the supplier side? So each one of these suppliers, they have to go out and uh, purchase a certain amount, and that volume is called your PLC, customer peak load contribution. Peak load contribution is 
when the entire PJM grid over 13 states has the, the top five hours in the previous summer, they look to that highest day and they look to the hour within that highest, the highest hour within that day, and then they look at an individual consumer and say, what were you consuming on that hour? You know, in other words, what was your contribution to this really high peak? Um, we won't know those when those hours occur until after the summer. So it's a kind of a look back. So they do that for the five highest hours. They average that individual customer's uh, consumption during those hours, and that is the volume that the supplier has to buy. And then it's just that volume times that auction price. So when are these hours occurring? Well, this is the, for the past six years, um, when those hours occurred. And it's really not a huge surprise. It is hot out. It is humid out. You, you know, you're feeling uncomfortable. It's when people get home from work and they're cranking on their ACs in their house. And 30 out of the past 36 PLC hours have occurred between the hours of 4 and 5 p.m. So how do customers help mitigate this capacity cost? We can't affect the auction rate. It's already been set. But can we affect how much of this stuff we have to buy? Or are there other programs out there that give us money back? And the answer is yes to both those. Um, and they both involve managing customer load during critical periods. Uh, not every customer can do this. You know, if you are a, an extrusion company where you're, um, you know, doing uh, plastic extrusion, it costs a lot of money to shut down that operation midstream because all that stuff gets hardened in your equipment, and that may not be worth it to you to do that. But I'm going to start with demand response, which Carrie alluded to also. Um, demand response is a payment for being there to shut down when PJM needs you. And this is not an economic play. It is the grid is very close to rolling blackout. You are a, an asset that we can turn down. And from a grid standpoint, whether they turn on a generator or turn off load, it creates the stability that they need. So, Demand response is treated as if it were a power plant. It gets paid a little less on capacity, but it still gets paid. Uh, there are folks, third-party administrators, that manage demand response for customers. They're called curtailment service providers. And these guys interface. They're the liaison between the customer and PJM. And they go out and do all the commercial deals aggregate the load so that PJN just gives one dispatch signal to those uh, curtailment service providers to get their lot of customers to turn down. Um, there are rules around how often PJM can call these events and how long they can call these events. In Ohio, really, we haven't seen a ton of activity uh, from PJM in this area. Last year, we did see First Energy customers receive five signals, uh, and that's the highest of any year, um, but maybe an indicator, based on what Carrie was saying, of the future. You know, with all these power plant shutdowns, it does stress the grid, and we're in a you know, three- to five-year period before we see this new generation hitting the market, that demand response may be called on more often than what we've seen in the past. Um, but in general, once a customer signs up for a program like this uh, and the curtailment service provider gets their cut of the deal, and that's how generally these uh, transactions are done, is they receive a cut of the full payment. Uh, a, an industrial customer can expect around 65% of that total capacity cost coming back to them in the form of payment. 
So while they're paying all this money to their supplier for this increase of capacity, they're also receiving more money from a curtailment service provider, and the net of the two then uh, is really what they're, they have to pay. The, the enrollment season for demand response is basically now for this summer. There is a deadline um, for most curtailment service providers of uh, mid-April so that they can get the assets enrolled by June 1 of, of this summer. That is kind of what I would call the easiest way to manage these capacity costs because there, there may not be a ton of events, and especially Dayton's never had an event. I think AEP has had two events, um, and Duke has never had an event. So that's an easy way to try to get some of this uh, money recovered. The more aggressive way is called PLC management. And if you remember in a couple slides earlier, I had an equation that said you have, it's volume times rate, and that volume is this PLC. If we could predict when these hours were to occur and a customer turned down their consumption to try to clip those hours ahead of the time, then when PJM were to look and say, okay, what did you contribute to that peak? It's something less than what you would have been. And anything less than what you would have done is money in, your, in their pocket. Um, and it's linear. If it's you know, half of what they would have done, they're going to get half of the cost shown up in their supply agreement because the supplier only has to buy half uh, of that capacity obligation. So this is kind of a predictive measure um, where suppliers will produce a signal to industrial customers that this is, has a high probability of being a PLC day. And we know through statistics that those hours occur between 4 and 5. Uh, you may want to take action. Um, and since we know what the auction rate is, we can quantify what the value of that hour could be. And once the industrial customer understands that quantification, then they can make a choice as to do we blow through and just run normally or is it worth it to us to actually try to clip this hour and reduce our consumption? So the idea on this is, is to, to get those hours predicted in a way that doesn't exercise the industrial consumer to death. You try to give no more than 10 signals to capture the five hours. The value of this flows through your supplier invoice and is linearly uh, proportioned to how you respond uh, to those signals. So if you don't do anything, then you're not going to receive any benefit. If you do 100%, you're going to receive full benefit in the form of zero capacity charges from the supplier. So let's look at some dollars and cents here. I know we're getting close to the end. Um, so for a first energy customer, again, they're paying the highest capacity prices in the state. Uh, if they were to participate with one megawatt into demand response, the value of that, assuming a 75% split to the curtailment service provider, that administrator, um, over a three-year period is around $139,000, which again is just one megawatt times the auction rate, times 365 days a year, times the 75% split. If you wanted to do next step, which is let's look at PLC management, the value gets a little bit stronger because you're not splitting this with anybody. And you're, you're getting the full price of capacity, not the PJM demand response price of uh, demand response. So if you're able to uh, do kind of both programs together, the total value of those programs is almost $200,000 of money back. Uh, and during these years, June of 15 and June of 16, 
if you were able to clip every hour and be at zero, uh, you would essentially have no capacity costs in your supply agreement. Um, so we're seeing some of this getting some traction, uh, mostly by necessity. Uh, there's a lot of businesses up in northern Ohio that are completely, um, you know, very impacted by the rates uh, that they're going to be seeing up there, and they're starting to take action. But certainly we've seen an increase of demand response participation because the value is good for the, for the uh, estimated activity that that customer will have to do. So I think that concludes my presentation. Great, thanks, Suzanne. Um, we've we've run right up to the end of the schedule time. Uh, we want to be respectful of folks' time. Uh, if there is one or two questions that come through, we could try to do that, understanding that people would be going beyond the time commitment. One suggestion I could make to folks when you do get the evaluation form, uh, if there are particular aspects of what we've covered today in all its complexity, uh, please, uh, if, you want, if you think there would be benefit to uh, look at those in more depth in the future uh, or on a standalone basis, uh, identify that so that the Voinovich School uh, will be aware of it and try to work that into their programming. Um, Scott, I'm not seeing any questions here, so maybe I'll just turn it back over to you. Okay. Well, thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. And I, I feel like uh, we've, we've had a, a bit of a graduate seminar in uh, Ohio's electricity market today. We covered a lot of ground. Um, I want to uh, take just a moment and thank all of our presenters. It's a terrific, uh, terrific uh, set of presentations, a lot of information here. Um, and I um, want to just ask everybody once again, as Mark said, please fill up the evaluation when you get it. We do pay attention to those. Um, some of the programming that you've seen this year is a re direct response of the, the, the questions that we've been posed in those evaluations. Uh, please don't hesitate to, to reach out to us directly uh, either. Um, and as I mentioned before, a copy of this webinar will be archived on our website later, th later this week. Um, at uh, www.ohio.edu backslash CE3. And with that, I uh, will once again thank our panelists, thank all of the attendees, and uh, we will officially close this webinar. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Goodbye. Thanks, Scott. Thanks.